<laughs> so pretty easy, right? Um, you just take what you want to know and write it like hard drive style to your brain, and then you know. Kind of, um, but here is how learning works for most of us. <laughs> Super exciting. Yeah. Bit of a difference. Um, so you can imagine uh, you know, Neo downloading information directly to his brain as kind of one extreme, maybe the fastest people could possibly learn, and then learning from a boring teacher who doesn't relate to you and doesn't present information in an effective way as kind of another extreme when learning is slow. And uh, what we're trying to do is find you know, something close to the science fiction end uh, where we could get you to learn about anything that you wanted as fast as you possibly could. And I don't view this just as a kind of academic question um, or even a question uh, you know, in my life as a, an educator. Um, I think this is a societal issue. So um, one reason is that the pace of human knowledge is, uh, kind of is expanding at an ever-increasing rate. Um, so one of my favorite examples is back in the day, getting a PhD in chemistry meant you learned all of chemistry, everything humans knew about chemistry. Today, getting a PhD in chemistry often means learning about or discovering one molecule. And it's not that we're less capable today. If anything, we're more capable today, and we have fancier tools to help us be more productive. It's that the field has expanded so much that there's as much to learn or more about one molecule than there used to be about the entire field of chemistry. And the same could be said of any field, virtually any field. Um, so how we train the next generation of scientists to uh, kind of discover needs to adapt to the reality that the pool of knowledge that we have to learn about is getting bigger every day at an ever-increasing rate. Further, sorry, did you have a question? No, just stretching, <laughs> scratching your nose. Yeah, further, nose scratching, no. Um, also, it relates to like, non-academic areas of life, so job training, the skills that you know, workers are getting are, are way more productive today than they used to be. They have you know, fancier tools to work with also. But that means that the way workers think has to incorporate information from a lot more kind of areas of human knowledge than used to be. So how do we meet this challenge? Um, well, before we get into how, you could imagine how your own life might be different if you could learn super, super fast, or if you had tools for learning super fast. So imagine what would happen if you could learn or become conversational in a totally new language in just a few hours, or memorize a few textbooks in a few hours, or get your undergraduate degree in a few hours, or get your PhD in a few hours. I don't know if a few hours is the right time scale here, but it would certainly be different if instead of majoring in one or two or five things in college, we could major in everything. Or instead of getting just one PhD, you could get five or 100 PhDs. Um, imagine if everyone could speak every language. I think it would change how people interact, how we think. You wouldn't, like collaboration would be totally different. You wouldn't have to seek out an expert who knew what you didn't know. You'd both know the same stuff and you could share at a higher level kind of your kind of creative insights that are different across people. So what are the kind of barriers to learning really quickly? Well, one way of thinking about learning limitations is kind of hardware limitations of our brain and perceptual systems. So maybe there's a kind of bandwidth limitation to how fast we can measure stuff in the world. Like there's some you know, bit rate that our retinas can measure stuff from the world and transmit, 
transmit information to our visual cortex, or you know, analogously for other senses. Or maybe there's a tension barrier. So even uh, accounting for the bit rate, maybe what we can attend to is a subset of what we can physically measure. Or maybe what we can encode in our memories is a subset of what we can attend. Or maybe even if we're encoding way more than we might ever need, what we can it, we have some search problem uh, where information that got encoded just can't be found by by our re memory retrieval systems. Or maybe encoding and retrieval and perception and attention are not the limits, but the way we communicate information or uh, you know from teachers to students, maybe that's done inefficiently. Um, so all of these factors, I think probably play a role in how fast, in kind of determining the upper limits of how fast we could learn. Um, but I don't actually think we're even close enough to achieving our kind of peak learning potential that we're yet needing to take into account these factors. I think um, the real challenge is when we teach, there's a pain, there, it, learning is painful sometimes. And I think that pain reflects when what we need to know in order to best further our insight in a particular moment, you know, in terms of getting us to a learning goal, is often misaligned with what we hear from the person teaching us or from the source that's teaching us. And I think the way to solve the kind of next generation of learning approaches and techniques is to try to figure out how can we align what you need to know with what you actually receive in that moment? So if we want to, I, I think this has to be done in an automated way. And yes, let's, let's uh, get there. I have some ideas for how to define it. Yeah, all this stuff is very new. So my ideas, well, this goes for even old stuff. My ideas are not necessarily the right ideas. I'm just going to give you my opinion. Okay, What do we need to do to really solve this problem? Well, if we want anyone to be able to learn about anything, some like our approach is going to have to be scalable. So, and it also has to generalize to any sort of thing we might want to learn. Okay, That's requirement one. Second, fortunately, there's a ton of kind of educational material out there, like uh, online courses like Khan Academy, Coursera, EDX, etc., um, where human teachers have put in possibly millions of hours creating thousands and thousands of cor courses on nearly every imaginable topic. And let's try to leverage that to uh, rather than trying to like put in a new million hours of effort. And finally, I think to really kind of get this stuff to catch on, I think learning needs to be easy. It can't require an extra real uh, effort on the part of the learner. So learning should be just as easy as it is now, or um, at least not harder than it is now. Um, what we need to do, I think, is change how, like, how and when we present stuff to people. OK. So how could this work? Well. I think we essentially need to do three things. We need to keep track of what your learning goal is. And there's a really interesting and difficult to solve dependency problem in learning, where you can't just learn about any arbitrary thing at any given moment. Often, learning a new concept requires already knowing other stuff on which that concept is built. Okay? So that problem needs to be solved in order to solve learning in the general case. Second, we need a model of what you know. Otherwise, we can't make use of those dependencies. And we also need to know how well you can learn about arbitrary things, also perhaps using those dependencies. And uh, the second piece is tricky to solve because I can't at every moment ask you about every possible concept that humans could think about. right? So if I wanted a dynamic map of what you know or how well you could learn about different things, I need, I'm going to need some model to help me make those predictions quickly and dynamically. And then we have to leverage the dependency structure of knowledge and what you know and how well you can learn 
to, in each new moment, present you with the optimal thing that you need to get you as close, to change your knowledge map uh, as much as possible in the direction of what you want to learn. Here's a flow chart kind of diagramming that same slide. So you can imagine, well, we can get into uh, next, like what this, these maps might look like, but here's a cartoon version. So you can imagine a, a map where each point, like each of these circles represents some concept you could think of, and the red circles re represent things that aren't kind of immediately relevant to your learning goals now, and then the green circles are things that you want to learn about. Okay. And you might have, like, often learning isn't just about, like, learning the definition of a word, but you might learn some whole kind of sequence of concepts that may be related to each other. Okay. Then, given your learning goal, using some technique, and we have some ideas of how to do this, uh, but I don't think it's a solved problem, we could try to map out what do you know now, and that's going to be some different map where we color each dot here red if you don't know that thing up to some threshold and green if you do. And then we could also make a similar map uh, describing how well you could learn about the content at each point in content space, where maybe darker shading reflects things that you have more potential to learn and lighter shading means things that we might think are harder for you to learn. The idea is that given your kind of map of what you know and how well you can learn, we could say, let's rank all possible videos, like all YouTube videos, for example, or all parts of YouTube videos, according to the content of those videos and what you know and what your learning goal is, and rank them according to how much benefit we think you'll get out of watching that video content, that course video content. And, and, and where benefit is defined as your expected change in your knowledge map in the direction of the things that you care about as defined by your learning goal. Does that make sense? OK. Then the idea is we're just continually going through this loop. And then we present you with the next thing. If your learning goal is achieved, so if your current knowledge map looks sufficiently close to your learning goal, we stop. Or if your time limit has elapsed, we, you stop. And then otherwise, we display the next thing to you, update your knowledge or our estimate of your knowledge and your ability to learn, and then keep cycling through. So I think this sort of setup defines kind of the high-level algorithm for what a AI version of a teacher would look like. Okay. So each of these pieces represents kind of a substantial theoretical and computational challenge, and my lab has is working on solving all of these challenges, but we've only succeeded in, I think, solving or approaching some of them. Yes? Is there I don't think people should get to decide what they want to learn. No, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's pretty critical. Yeah. I mean, I think motivation is a fundamental part of learning. If you don't care about learning something, you're just not going to learn it. I mean, you don't have to pay attention to what I'm saying. Wait, so you mean like selecting what your knowledge, your learning goal is, or? Well, the idea here is that there's some pool of material that exists on the internet. So, uh, I'll I'll describe kind of our approach, but I mean, I'll say this again in a couple slides. But we're using um, as our kind of resource pool of things that you could learn from. We're using. Uh, all of the videos on one uh, online learning platform, uh, Khan Academy. And we have a model of like what each moment of each course is about. And then uh, the idea is, for now in our experiments, we select a learning goal for you. So we say, we want you to learn about like statistical physics or something, or some concept in statistical physics. And then we say, what do you know now? And then what sequence of things do I have to show you in order to get you up to this level of understanding in that content area? So as an, ex like an experiment approach, we pick your learning goal for you. But in general, you can imagine a like, web platform where you type in, in like 
plain English, what you want to learn about, and then some kind of stream of video comes at you that's drawn from existing courses, kind of remixed to form the optimal course for you personally. Yeah, so right now this is kind of in its infancy. So that is one of many controls on our list. So you can imagine lots of controls that we'd want to do. So the core sequence that's optimal for you, is that also optimal for everyone else? Um, are, or are, at least are there similarities across kind of the op optimal course sequences given what you want to learn about? Um, do our course instructors good at determining course sequences? our current approach is to just an instructor kind of teaches to the average of everyone in the room or something like that. Um, we could test that theory. Um, are people able to judge for themselves what they know and don't know or what they would benefit from? Um, so we can compare this to all sorts of these sorts of controls. Or can I show you a video a sequence that's chosen by what someone else thinks they would learn best from, et cetera? Yes, um, I think you raised your hand first. Yeah. This, is, this is really cool, but I'm wondering, like, how are you guys accounting for forgetting? Um, mm -hmm. People, like, are going to forget things over time. Are you, like, hoping that your dependency tree um, for, like, the concepts that you're learning will, I guess, like, counteract the rate of forgetting over time? Wait, does anyone else forget things? <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah, I, we think, so, I mean, there are lots of interesting models of forgetting. Um, one way that we tend to think about forgetting in my lab is, um, so if you learn, if you know something at one point, you know that the information got encoded into your brain somehow. So it's there in some sense. Now, it can be overwritten by something else, and you know, we never know if that happens. But we think of uh, kind of forgetting as a retrieval problem, so it's like, the information is there, but you can't get it. Um, so there's lots of work on like relearning or priming, and these effects can, you know, learning something now can affect your ability to learn the same thing in like years. So I think that to me is good evidence that the stuff is there in some sense, even if it's hard to access. Um, but you're right that things do get harder to access, you know, given longer time delays. Did, did you have a question? Sorry. Yeah, so uh, the way that we're defining uh, kind of optimality here is your expected gain in knowledge weighted by how much each concept that you're learning about is relevant to your current learning goal. So it's like your expected, the expectation is taken with respect to your learning goal. Yes? So one of the reasons we've picked the Khan Academy platform is that almost all of the courses are like whiteboard based, mostly the same person talking or the same kind of voice. And um, everything is like writing on a, it's like colorful text on a black background, same sort of handwriting style almost entirely. Um, and so it's actually not super jarring to remix kind of scenes from different videos. Um, but in the general case, you can imagine it would be. So if we took like all internet videos and then tried to remix them, like you know the kind of styles of the different videos would, I think, be jarring. Um, one of the things we're thinking about uh, for the future is is uh, which I don't think is quite there yet. But you know, 
maybe in a few years will be, is uh, text to video uh, kind of style transfer sorts of mappings. So given you know, if we can come up with the optimal content that you'd need to learn next, maybe we could, in a few years, construct a Khan Academy style video on the fly that teaches you about that content. OK, 10 minutes left? Five minutes. OK, so I'm, I'm like not going to get through most of this, but that's fine. Um, happy to chat with you about any of this. Um, let's see. Let me just give you a few kind of highlights of how we're thinking about this stuff. So one of the things we need to, we've, we've, you know, this workshop is on maps. And the way that we think of knowledge is as a map. Um, and we can create these maps by defining geometric spaces where each point in these spaces reflects some concept or set of concepts you could think about. And then the geometry of these spaces is set up so that points that are nearby in, in Euclidean distance reflect concepts that are similar in semantic meaning. So like duck and goose live close to each other, and then duck and truck live far apart. And uh, at each moment, we could think a particular thought or set of thoughts, and that corresponds to like a point or a cloud in this space. And then over time, as our thoughts change, or as the content of a course changes, that's going to trace out some interesting looking or not interesting looking, a trajectory. Um, and then there are all kinds of interesting questions uh, that you can ask about these trajectories. Like in a memory experiment, kind of replay looks like loops in these trajectories, right? Revisiting old thoughts. Um, in a course, we could ask like hyper aligning videos that are about different things. So like crossing through different parts of these spaces, are there particular shapes of these trajectories that are more or less effective at conveying information from the teacher's brain into student's brain, et cetera? Um, we've, I'm happy to talk about these models uh, for people in uh, the hackathon group that I'm part of. Uh, we're like playing around with these models. So if you want to learn more, come join our group. Um, but we fit these models to all videos on Khan Academy. Um, and it's, there's a cool way of doing this where we take the audio transcripts and we uh, do speech to text on them. And then we can do character recognition and image recognition. And everything results in a bunch of text for each kind of moment of video. And then we treat that as a document and get a feature vector out of it. So you can plot like what each course is about in these kind of thought spaces. Um, that's interesting. And then within a single video, you can say, what is the content of that video, and how does it change over time? And so here are a bunch of kind of feature dimensions of semantic meaning. And over time, a given video is going to kind of fade in and out uh, different feature dimensions. You can also. Uh, ask people questions about the content, like conceptual questions about the content of the video. And if the questions can be converted to text, each question also gets a coordinate in these concept spaces. And then you can ask, how much is each question uh, like asking about the conceptual content of each moment of the video by correlating these uh, feature vectors for each question and each moment of video? And so you can get a time course of how much each given question, shown here as a color of a line, uh, is about that moment of video. Another way of visualizing this is as a trajectory through a feature space. So this trajectory corresponds to a low dimensional embedding of this matrix. So each point here reflects some feature vector, a row of this matrix. And then the questions uh, co also correspond to points. And then we can color them green if you get the question right, and red if not. And then we can ask. At each moment of the video, what weighted proportion of questions do you get right, where the weights are determined by how much each question was asking about that part of the video? And it's a super powerful technique because it gives you a full time series of how well you learned the content at each moment of each video. And it's different from uh, nearly all kind of learning metrics that at least I'm familiar with and probably that's been, that have been used in your courses where 
You know, you might say, I got a 75 or an 83 on my exam, and that single number is used as a proxy for how well you know math. Here, we can specifically model how much you know or don't know about kind of each aspect of the content of the course. Yes? There are, there are a gazillion super interesting analyses. So we have done some of those, uh, or some analyses. Um, I think I'm, how much time do I have left? Like two minutes? Uh, yeah, I'll say like two. All right, so I have uh, only about an hour left. <laughs> um, why don't I hold off? If you want to see data, we have some data. Uh, come, come chat with me, yes. Yeah, uh, OK, let me skip. It's hard to model that stuff, first of all. Um, there's a, maybe I'll just make one point and then we can end, um, kind of related to analogies. So I mentioned there's a dependency structure of learning that uh, is difficult to model and yet critical for kind of solving these problems, I think. The sorts of analogies that you're talking about um, could be captured by asking, like, how do you learn about a high-level concept? And then the way you learn about a high-level concept could kind of trickle down to uh, lower-level concepts that are children of that higher-level concept. Um, another kind of neat feature of the Khan Academy platform is that there are about 20,000 videos uh, in total on the platform, and each video uh, has been human annotated uh, according to which concepts from which other videos it is dependent on. And so for any given concept covered by Khan Academy that you want to learn about, we can ask which content do you need to see first or do you need to know first in order to learn from that thing. We can leverage that dependency structure in selecting what videos we show you next or what content, what parts of which videos we show you next. And then there's a really interesting link between the dependencies of knowledge and generally kind of how we think about semantic meaning. So here is a, uh, a kind of subtree of Princeton WordNet, which is a uh, kind of hierarchical semantic model. Each node of this tree represents some concept. And then the tree is organized in is a relationships. So each node is an instance of its parent node. So like a fork is a type of cutlery, is a type of tableware, is a type of ware, <laughs> is an article, is an artifact, is a whole thing, is an object, is a physical entity, is a entity, etc. cetera. Um, so you know, human, probably undergraduates, um, I guess, we've determined undergraduates might not be human, um, have uh, painstakingly like, annotated nearly every word in English um, and put it into this WordNet framework. Uh, not it's not only semantics that are organized in this hierarchical way. Oh, sorry. The point I wanted to make here is that um, in Kim's talk, uh, you mentioned non-Euclidean spaces, and I think this is a uh, you know imp this is a potential way of kind of linking up what I've drawn as Euclidean spaces with kind of non-Euclidean graph ideas, where even if two concepts are far apart in terms of meaning, if they share a parent, maybe we can kind of leverage non-Euclidean links between those concepts and kind of improving on our estimates of knowledge and learning. In addition to semantics, nearly every other thing we think about, um, at least that I'm aware of, is like tends to fall into this hierarchical organization. So we think about 
spatial patterns as hierarchical. So we think of like we're on planet Earth in New Hampshire, in Hanover, in a, on a like Dartmouth's campus, in a particular building, in a particular room. And each of those representations activates some part of some map at some scale. We also think about time in a hierarchical way. And there's a time is particularly interesting from a memory standpoint and from a kind of dynamics of thought standpoint in that uh, smaller spatial scales or lower level concepts tend to also be associated with shorter time scales. And uh, there are interesting links between how like the time courses of how thoughts and concepts and experiences evolve uh, versus how we remember them later. Um, I think I'll end by thanking the many people in my lab. Um, I want to highlight uh, the people who specifically are kind of focused on contributing to this project. Uh, Andy Heiser is a former postdoc in the lab, but still kind of contributing thoughts to this project. Um, Paxton Fitzpatrick, who is a uh, MIND attendee. Uh, Max Bluestone and Will Baxley um, also contributed to this project. And then, of course, our funding agencies without which or without whom this work would not be possible. All right, thanks. <laughs>